Welcome everyone to 52 Living Ideas. Tonight is Comprehensivist Wednesdays. This is done in conjunction with the Greater Philadelphia Thinking Society. And tonight we'll be continuing on the book Mimesis uh, by Eric Auerbach. And this is our third or fourth session, I believe, uh, with this uh, on, on this book. And this tonight we'll be going back to the foundations of Mimesis. So uh, Phil, why don't you take it away from there? Okay, thanks. Uh, so as Joe just said, we are going through Our Box Mimesis, which is a uh, very well-known uh, book in uh, liter literary circles, but also among wider audience, just because of its impact on our understanding of Western literature and specifically the evolution of mimesis, or mimesis, however you say it, um, in Western literature. Mimesis, of course, is just a fancy word for representation of reality. Uh, so Auerbach is essentially tracing the different ways that authors, starting from a classical Greek um, civilization and all the way to um, more modern European Western civilization, uh, represent a reality in their works. Uh, this is a really fascinating uh, account um, as, as we'll look at different ways that writers have tried to portray reality. Now, and I, and I mentioned this to Joe and to Srikant earlier, we could have started with Plato and Aristotle in the beginning, uh, but I'm actually kind of glad we didn't because now that we've done some of the, um, some of the work and looked at you know, some of these um, writers, we, we've gotten to Dante last time. Now we can, knowing what we, what we know now, we can go back to, uh, hello, Madeline. Uh, <laughs> uh, now we can go back to um, uh, the foundation and talk about the two authors that Auerbach is really uh, in conversation with, uh, uh, or has been in conversation with this whole time. And the two authors, of course, are Plato and Aristotle. Now, both of them have had very interesting and foundational ideas about mimesis and, and what its role is and what, what it is, uh, in fact, and also uh, about their idea of art uh, as it relates to mimesis. Uh, and so I wanna just take a few moments to set the stage for this. I, ho I hope you had a chance to read um, uh, Plato's Republic uh, book 10, at least uh, maybe an excerpt from it, if not the whole thing. Uh, and also uh, Aristotle's Poetics. Both of those works are really very accessible to read. Um, they are surprisingly easy to, to follow. Uh, so don't be scared uh, to read them. They're, like I said, very accessible and quite enjoyable in their own, in their own right. So uh, I'll just um, set the context a little bit and uh, just, some, just try to summarize the main points. Uh, from Plato and Aristotle on, on, on the topic. So Plato in uh, the Republic, uh, he comes to this point where they're talking about uh, the role of artists uh, in this idealized state that they're trying to, to build, right? Republic is all about building a perfect society. And the question comes up, well, in this perfect society, what is the role of artists and specifically um, poets, uh, artists that create using uh, words, right, as their, as their um, mode of operation. So Plato has quite a, a lot to say about it, and he's a little bit negative. If you notice, you've read the um, uh, book 10, but, but, it is, but his critique is very um, interesting because it goes back to his concept of uh, forms or ideas, right? In Greek forms are ideas or ideas, uh, same thing, right? That's, and uh, of course, um, the idea of forms is that everything we see in this world, according to Plato, is a reflection of some deeper meaning which is canonized in these eternal ideas that have preceded and have existed eternally, they're eternal. So the things that we see with our senses, things that are changeable, are, are mere shadows of the eternal realities. 
Now, if that is true, uh, everything we build in the physical world, everything we create uh, in, uh, materially is once at least once removed from this perfect idea, right? We have some conception of that uh, per perfect ideal. He talks about a chair, which is, I think it makes it a little bit silly because immediately you start going down that path of uh, material things and it, it's a little bit distracting. But the idea is if you have a sort of this ideal chair, then the carpenter creates an actual chair based on that. A poet <laughs> takes this a, a further and he creates a work of art that then imitates a physical object that was created by uh, an artisan. So he is now thrice removed from this perfect conception. And according to Plato, that's the problem with artists in general is that they are imitating not based on I, on the ideal, they're imitating life and, and in general, I mean, the subjects of their works are imitations, not of the ideal, but of the, um, of the, the changeable, the observable, right? The, um, the phantoms, or another word for that is eidolon, you know, which is of course the Greek word um, for um, like a shadow or a likeness. And we get the word idol from that. So uh, this is this is maybe hearkening back to some of the things we said with Owen Barfield about uh, idols and perception and um, kind of the connection between that and what is real. So in Plato's mind, we should be very careful about these uh, artists, uh, whether they are literary or any musicians or any any kind of art, because all it's doing is it's imitating things that are uh, very much removed from what he considers to be the beacons of truth, you know, these ideal forms. All right, so that's Plato. And of course, Auerbach, you know, he is constantly in, in conversation uh, uh, with Plato on that score, but that's not all. So um, that's uh, Plato, of course, Aristotle, who uh, was his pupil, took that idea and he disagreed with Plato markedly on this, on this subject. Starting from the attitude in general, he, he uh, said that Plato's attitude towards the arts is wrong. And the reason it's wrong, according to Aristotle, is because imitation, mimesis, is in our nature. That is one very interesting observation that he makes that I think is very uh, keen and um, uh, just shows how uh, insightful um, Aristotle was. He says, children imitate from their earliest age, that's how they learn. And in fact, the pleasure we get from watching plays, from reading books, from observing, even listening to music, and music, uh, we should say that in Greece, um, music was also imitative. Unlike what it is today, they, they actually did try to imitate natural sounds and, and some messes applied to music as, as much as it did to the other arts. So uh, in Aristotle's mind, uh, the reason why we enjoy watching um, uh, or participating in art is because that's how we learn. That's how we learn about the real world. And that's the pleasure. That's the reason for the pleasure that we get from, you know, from watching it. So uh, 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 quite opposite to Plato, uh, his idea was, no, 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 we should encourage art, but we should make sure that it is uh, following these high standards that are required to make uh, good uh, art and poetry. Poetry, of course, was the uh, kind of the queen of arts. Um, of course, the word poet, uh, it, uh, its root is from the uh, po poesis, uh, uh, poeo, uh, which is the Greek verb for I, I create, I make, you know, it's a, it's a craftsman. But of course, poets create with, with words. And um, Aristotle takes this idea and he says, okay, well, let's just talk about poetry. Uh, let's, you know, music aside, um, visual arts aside, let's just talk specifically about um, poetry as a, as, a, as a genre. And uh, by poetry, he means all fiction, right? All fictional writing. So not, not Plato's dialogues, that's not poetry, uh, not, um, you know, Herodotus, well, maybe, I don't know, by Herodotus histories, it could be considered fictional as well, uh, maybe, but not, let's say, um, a, a, tr um, 
a treatment of minerals or herbs or something like that. Uh, just you know, fictional writing. And so, what what is uh, how can we classify fictional writing? Of course, you know, if you know anything about Aristotle, he loves to classify everything. He's very good at that. And so he classifies poetry into um, uh, into three branches. And of course, these branches are very familiar to us because we have been discussing the high and the low style that Auerbach is constantly dealing with. And in, uh, in Aristotle's time, it was already quite pronounced, the differences and the understanding about uh, the differences between these, um, these styles. And so he very clearly delineates them as epic poetry, uh, which is in Greek, epopeia, uh, tragic drama, tragodia, or tragodia, I should say in Greek, and comedy, comedia. Uh, epopeia is what we would call epic, epic literature, right? So ep epic drama. Uh, tragodia is uh, also epic, but it's mostly an uh, epic that is um, performed. So the only difference really that he makes between uh, epic poetry and uh, tragedia is, is one is meant as a narrative to be read and the other one is meant to be performed. So an example of epic poetry would be Iliad, example of tragedia would be uh, Oedipus Rex. Uh, and then you have the third one and the third one is comedia, uh, that's comedy. Uh, uh, which is uh, an example of the lo low style, right? The first two are examples of the high style, and the third one is the uh, low style. And where, where does this distinction originate? Well, he says it just so happened kind of historically that there were certain meters, poetic meters, that were associated with epic poetry. Of course, the most famous one is hexameter, uh, which is used by Homer everywhere. And uh, uh, Tragodia also uses uh, a particular meter and particular lexicon that uh, uh, the comedies do not use. The comedies use more of a, um, a low style language, kind of a jargon language, um, very different from, from the first two. So that's, that's his division. And of course, this is you know, dovetailing right to, straight to our box um, emphasis on how Western uh, literature in its development and mimesis in its development have, ha, uh, has um, struggled to reconcile these two styles and to uh, at different points in, in history uh, to relegate different areas of life to one or to the other and then to bring them together and then in, in conversation with uh, other cultures and other religions such as Christianity most importantly uh, to to try to synthesize some, some sort of unity uh, about that. But that of course comes, comes later. In Aristotle's mind, these are the three branches. They should be kept separate. If you're writing good poetry, you should be aware of these distinctions and you should use the proper um, lexicon, proper style, proper meter uh, to, to, to do each one well. Uh, that's his uh, assertion. Uh, very quickly, uh, a couple of other points that he makes is that he, he definitely agrees with Plato that the object of poetry is mimesis. Uh, so the object of poetry is to imitate life. Uh, interestingly, the word he uses for life is the same word. Uh, I like to do these kind of word studies because it helps me to kind of uh, get at the essence of, of these things that are discussed. And Greek, of course, being so precise about its wording is really good for that. Um, so the word he uses for life is the same word that we use today uh, to describe randomness. Uh, uh, the word is stochastic, well, it's the, the root word of stochastic process, you know, uh, um, it's um, I've written down here somewhere, etuhe, etuhe. Um, interestingly, his idea of representing life that is random is to have a uh, plan that is anything but random. <laughs> and in fact, he makes a point of it to say that nothing in the plot, nothing in the production of this, um, of, of a good work of art should be random. It should all be uh, thought through precisely, precisely arranged, should have a unity of design and purpose and 
uh, the more it is so, the more it, it will actually be uh, a good mimesis, good imitation of, of life. Uh, and then the objects of, of poetry are people, and uh, people fall into three categories, people that are better than us, people that are about the same as us, and then people that are worse than us. And you can kind of see where he's going with that, because of course, people that are better than us, those are the protagonists in tragedies and epic uh, poetry and the people that are kind of the same as us and or lower than us these are the heroes of comedies uh, so that's uh, that's kind of obvious um, and then he talks about uh, the mode of poetry which is one way uh, you can do this is through a narrative that's the idea of an author just making a making a story uh, and telling you a story he's the author is you know you don't see him but he is the person that's telling you the story. So right away, like uh, Homer, you jump into the storyline. There's no introduction of who is who. You don't know who is telling you the story. It's just the story is there. That's the narrative mode. Uh, the, the other mode is through uh, a character. And that, that, of course, is the distinction between tragedy and epic poetry. In Aristotle's mind, tragedy is played out, it's performed. And the way you understand it is through interaction uh, with the characters. So you're introduced immediately to the characters and they are the ones that are acting everything out and everything is seen through their eyes. So this is kind of this multi-perspective approach. We've seen this in our book um, when we talked about the difference between Homer um, where it's narrative and let's say, um, uh, who am I thinking of? Uh, uh, the, the author of Satyricon, where you see life as they see it. So they, the, the characters of Satyricon are introducing us to, to their times and their experience through themselves. And the language they use is part of that representation. So that's the, that's the genius of it. But it, but it works either uh, equally well when you think of you know, classical Greek tragedies, it's the same thing. Uh, you see tragedy through Oedipus's eyes, right? What's happening? First he doesn't know, then he wants to know, then he finally does get to know. And I mean, you just follow the character. So that's the second way. And the third way is um, uh, when you tell a story from a particular person's perspective. And that could be, um, uh, that could be Odysseus telling us this, uh, uh, or Euryclea or uh, somebody else telling us a story of, from their perspective. This, so this could be tied into a narrative, just like we have it in, in Homer as well. So Homer uses both of those uh, modes. Uh, there are some other points that he makes, but I wanna stop here to just uh, get a sense for what you guys think about ideas of Plato and Aristotle. Uh, and then we'll jump back to Auerbach and just to try to see how you think um, he, kind of maybe look through this lens of Plato and Aristotle to see what Auerbach has been saying uh, in the last couple of, you know, in the last couple of chapters that we've covered. So I'll stop here. Um, Joe, do you want to kind of direct the... Uh... Sure. Uh, if you can, you can either type exclamation point in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom uh, in order to ask Phil a question. Uh, first up, we have Madeline. Hi, Joe. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, my question is about uh, Plato. Uh, I don't see why. I mean, it seems to me that in writing, uh, in, in, in the act of reading, the person is actually recreating the thing in their own mind. And uh, rather than looking at something like a sculpture, and so it seems to, or or or, or at a real chair. Uh, so I'm just going to stick with the chair. Uh, so it seems to me that wouldn't wouldn't that be closer to one of Plato's forms instead of farther away? That it's more abstract and less substantial. I mean, I I think I'm not I'm not sure how he thought about it all, but it seems to me that it could be closer to uh, these ideals than the actual chair itself right 
Yeah, well, that, that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, I don't know if it made a lot of uh, sense to Plato. I think his concern was the following. His concern was that, was that poets were degrading the ideal by the way they presented it. So his big beef, for instance, with some of the um, playwrights was, was the way they presented gods. So gods are presented everywhere in Greek mythology as basically uh, uh, humans, but with, with, with greater powers. So they have all the depravity, all the, um, all the same in base instincts of human beings. They don't really display a lot of nobility. Um, and yet they are divine somehow, right? They're in a class of their own. And so to Plato, that was uh, uh, this uh, influence that was somewhat degrading, especially to, to the young people who are not skilled in determining truth from error. And his idea was we, we have to outlaw this because if young people are going to see the way gods behave, then they're going to say, well, if gods are like this, then I should be imitating the gods. And, you know, morality kind of goes out the window. So in his mind, that was the biggest um, problem that he had. So the, uh, to answer your uh, question, I guess his idea was you, you put uh, the, the playwrights, they, they don't, when you read it or when you observe it uh, being performed, the idea that you get initially is the idea that they plant in your head. Where, where, where that idea goes after it's planted, that of course depends on a lot of things. But the idea, the starting point that they plant is far away from the ideal. That, that, that was his premise. And so his idea was, okay, we have, to, we have to do something about that. He didn't really deal a whole lot with um, kind of the inner world of the person who is re receiving this. He kind of assumed the worst. I think he was, he was a, 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 in that sense, he was a, very cynical, I would say, or maybe realistic, I don't know. Um, but I think that's, that's his, yeah, that was his concern. Did I answer that, the question, Madeline? Madeline, uh, I guess uh, you answered it sufficiently. Does anybody else have any questions? Sorry, uh, uh, yeah, yes, it did. Thanks, Phil. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions regarding uh, what Phil has put on the table thus far uh, regarding Aristotle or Plato? Well, if not, um, you know, basically the one question I would actually like to pose to you, Phil, is just this, uh, um, the approach that Aristotle really took towards storytelling. And it was very rigid uh, from what I remember. Um, and it was had to sp specifically, I must follow a very, very uh, specific format. And I remember reading this for various reasons as to, how it's still relevant today and and how you know and and how we present sometimes uh you know how we have the beginning and middle and end and all these things i was just wondering if you could expand upon that a little bit um because that's an important uh, I, part of how aristotle still impacts storytelling today right so i think uh you're absolutely correct he is very rigid they're all very rigid yeah, very <laughs> Apart much so. because they are they are the people that are setting the foundations, right? That's why we love the Greeks. That's why we hate the Greeks. I mean, they are the first ones that ask these types of questions. They wanted to set the foundations for everything else. When you do that, you have to almost by definition set certain limits, right? You want to delineate everything. You want to prescribe everything. You want to classify everything. And so by virtue of being the first one, you, you, you kind of get the, the dibs of uh, dividing everything up. Uh, the problem with that, of course, is like you said, the, the, the limits are too rigid and the rest is history, right? The rest is history of Western literature trying to explore these limits, trying to challenge these limits, and I think successfully challenging, challenging them and exploding them to, to the point where now we think it's laughable that there is some kind of high style. I mean, not, I, would, I don't want to say laughable because we still have a notion of the sort of classical versus non-classical, the high brow, low brow, all these things, they, they influence us, but modern literature has, I would say, successfully kind of exploded or imploded all of these uh, rigid um, 
uh, borders and uh, classifications. I have a lot of beef with Aristotle myself. Uh, one area, and I think Auerbach does too, based on what I've read of him. Uh, one specific one that I will just mention here because I think it's super relevant to our overall discussion here is that Aristotle posits that um, the main thing in fiction is the action. <laughs> so he would have loved action movies, Aristotle, because uh, he says that, you know, character study, that's there because it's kind of like dressing um, to really explore the action. But the action is what really matters, right? Uh, we, don't, we, don't, we're not, we're not, we don't come to the theater to look at the person's uh, character. We come to the theater to, to find out what happened to him. And of course, um, taking that to his, um, using his classification uh, soapbox, he immediately divides that up into two main things that the plot typically develops. One is called peripeteia, which is the reversal, right? You start with somebody who has a good fortune and then something terrible happens to them. Or the second one is this idea of discovery, uh, anaxoresis. Uh, um, so you didn't know something and you found out something. And of course, in Oedipus Rex, you probably have a combination of those two, which is why it's such a memorable story. But, but he's right about one thing. If you follow these classical guidelines, you will probably write a good story. Uh, because everybody loves a good reversal, everybody loves a good discovery, <laughs> something you didn't know that you found out. And, and think of all the, like, think of a typical movie plot. I mean, you're going to have both of those things typically in there. Uh, and, it, but in addition to that, you'll have other things, right? <laughs> but, but Aristotle absolutely insists that um, plot uh, and, and fiction in general, the, the idea of mimesis is what are you imitating? Well, you're imitating what's happening to people. You know, the happening, that's the important part. The character, not so much. In other words, you'll get bored listening to some monologue about the inner struggles of, 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 of you know, this person or that person. Uh, I mean, again, he is, uh, he is uh, I think Americans should love Aristotle. I mean, uh, you know, all the action movies, all the you watch melodramas or whatever. I mean, it, it follows exactly that recipe. Not a lot of character development, uh, but a lot of that good action. Um, so get your popcorn yeah. and enjoy with your buddy Aristotle. Um, so yeah. But of course, so, uh, of course, uh, Auerbach, you know, right, right out of the gate, he kind of just, you know, he shows how uh, he falsifies this, right? I mean, everywhere in, everywhere you look, whether it's Greek drama, whether it's, um, uh, biblical writings or, or you know, I, I, I mean, probably the most obvious example would be Augustine's Confessions. Um, not a lot is going on in Augustine. I mean, things are going on, but most of it is what's happening inside. That's the whole point of Confessions. You're describing what's happening inside, not so much what's happening on the outside. And that's why the very first thing he describes is his childhood and him stealing these apples from an orchard. Not really you know, some earth-shaking uh, uh, event. But what, but what was earth, not to him, what was important was his nature and how it revealed his own um, uh, depravity to him. So, uh, and then of course we follow, I mean, when you, if, if we ever get to the end of our book, you know, we, we get to um, uh, Virginia Woolf uh, to the lighthouse and of course, that is, uh, I mean, Aristotle would hate, 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 hate that, that book. Uh, as probably some, some student, undergraduate, <laughs> undergraduate students, well, not, probably not graduate, but undergraduate students do too. Uh, because the whole book is the inner world of Mrs. Ramsey and, uh, and these children. And it's just one mental escapade after another. And uh, what's happening? Nothing is happening, right? It's just on you know stream of consciousness right that's the that's the style but it, but of course we've come to completely embrace that because how, how can you imitate life without imitating what's happening inside of us right we're not just objects that move other objects you know with our hands and feet uh so it's very strange in some ways that somebody as perceptive as aristotle had this crude notion that the most important thing is is just the action but he did so that's yeah. So 
Andrea has her hand up um, and then we'll come back and maybe I will ask a couple more just mm -hmm. clarification questions. Yeah. Okay. Good, Andrea. Oh, okay, you were breaking up a little bit there or it might've been me. I think I get that internet, your internet is unstable message. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, just fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I just have kind of a thing to add, sort of a question-ish thing, because um, I haven't come to some of the other meetups that were part of this series. Um, I attended another meetup um, with, I think it's like the Skeptics in the Pub or something on Sunday. And we were talking about the effect of media on behavior. And so uh, it is in my mind somehow related to this discussion um, because part of what I think we're talking about is what is the purpose of a story or what is the purpose of Aristotle's story? So is Aristotle's story, is the purpose of it entertainment or is the purpose of it influence or is the purpose of it to cause us to think more deeply about something? Um, and the discussion that we had on Sunday was um, the discussion leader had a whole bunch of articles about um, whether or not, like, for example, if you see a lot of violent media, that it actually influences you to commit violence, or if it repulses you from committing violence. So I don't know, Phil, if you could maybe talk a little bit about, or anybody else can add what they think the purpose of a story is from Aristotle's viewpoint. Is it is this more along the lines of rhetoric that you're talking about in the sense, uh, Andrea, like Aristotle's rhetoric? Because it's well, a little bit different I, from what. Well, but yeah, I'll you let Phil tell actually, me if I'll I'm let totally Phil. off topic. I, I um, like I said, I'm I'm just really kind of interested. You know, do we? Maybe I'm picking something different, but I mean, do we think that? Like, are we reading any of this stuff, assuming that the writer had a purpose in mind? Like, I'm going to write about this, and it's not just entertainment. I expect it to produce a result in the in the reading audience or not? Right. Am I explaining right. okay? Yeah, 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 no, I, yeah. That's clear. Yeah, yeah. I got. I think I got. I got the gist of the question. Okay, so from Aristotle's point of view, I think based on what I've read of him. He would probably say that, well, first of all, going back to the beginning, imitation is natural. So you're going to have fiction, you're going to have people producing stories just because everybody likes imitating life, right? So the, the author as a creator likes to imitate, and we like to observe this imitation. Well, we, we like mimesis because it teaches us about life. We get enjoyment. Part of that enjoyment is probably the craft of the uh the creator but but the other part is kind of didactic in the sense that we we get to observe what what can happen if if you do x right a lot of the stories in whether you're talking about aeschylus or shakespeare they're they're you know they're illuminating because they and they also let us kind of play out in our minds what would we have done in a similar situation right we always we automatically do that by the way and that's why we when we really get into something, we are with the hero, right? We're empathizing, right, with with the with the protagonist, and we are together with him, trying to solve whatever you know uh, conundrum we are in the middle of. Um, going back to our Bach and some of the previous conversations we've had, it's implied that um, different authors had a particular object in mind when they were writing. So whether it's um, uh, the biblical authors, right, who had a very singular object in mind, which is to uh, inspire devotion to God, and everything was really about that. Whether and and they used, but they used you know very different techniques from uh, what was used, let's say, by church fathers or by Dante or by um maybe even shakespeare or by uh, other authors so everybody has an object in mind when they write it's not just for entertainment i mean it's, that's almost a given i would say uh especially as we get into um i would say post medieval uh times uh almost all of writing has some kind of objective in mind it's mostly some type of 
persuasion, right? The, that is happening, right? You write something to move people, whether to move, move them both in their minds, in their hearts, you know, preferably both. But there is some kind of objective. It's not pure entertainment. Now, entertainment could be part of it. Uh, think of Shakespeare's comedies. Obviously, there's some entertainment value there. Tragedies, there's obviously some spectacle value there. And Aristotle, he is explicit about it as well. He mentions six different things that um, comprise a good recipe, if you will, or six elements of, of poetry or fictional or fiction in general, which I guess I, I, I had skipped over, but I can just mention them. Plot, is it plot, character, diction? Yep. Yeah, plot, character, diction, melody, um, spectacle. Mm -hmm. There's one more. Um, well, the way I have them is it's- Theme. Uh, yeah, the way I have them is uh, plot, then uh, character, then lexicon or diction, uh, then song, uh, acting or spectacle and thought. Uh, but the idea is you have these different elements and they're all there to achieve whatever objective you're trying to achieve, right? So you use all of them, whether it's entertainment, whether it's persuasion, whether it's um, uh, just recounting the events, right? We, we like, for instance, remember the, um, Gregory of Tours, the history of Franks. I mean, his, his, he's not necessarily trying to entertain. He's not really trying to persuade. He's just recounting what happened. Uh, so that's his objective, just to preserve the history. But, but th the way he does it, of course, is very unique. And, and he's also representing reality in, in doing that in, in his own way. So that's the, uh, that's the interesting part is everybody has their own objective, how they approach it and what they use to achieve it is slightly or not so slightly different and tracing that you know these distinctions and, and the development of that that's what you know that's what our block is all about so one thing i just think is a point of clarification maybe for everyone uh just and i know you've been through this in our previous sessions but maybe people haven't had an opportunity to actually watch the videos is to just go through maybe the highbrow and lowbrow distinction uh just really briefly uh just so that because that's such a critical concept in order for us to understand the, the rest of the discussion right so yeah so in in classical literature very early on uh there emerged a a clear-cut distinction between the way you portray certain uh subjects and basically you have things that are serious and uh, by serious, I, uh, I mean either they're tragic, they are epic in their scope and um, subject matter, and there are things that are somewhat trivial, somewhat um, less important, and they also tend to be either grotesque or farcical. And that uh, distinction, while already present in Homer, it, 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 you know, it got more and more uh, delineated, and not the least of the, of the influences were works like these by Aristotle that, that in fact clearly spelled out where, where the differences were. So he, our, Aristotle's uh, idea was that it just kind of emerged spontaneously that um, when you recounted, let's say some, when you rec uh, recounted maybe a, a mythology or, or something that's more classical and more serious in, in, uh, in its uh, import that hexameter emerged as the uh, choice meter. And of course, hexameter, you can't really, I mean, it's not really suited well for um, square, you know, talk uh, like marketplace vocabulary, right? So the mm -hmm. certain vocabulary uh, uh, followed the, uh, the style, right? Yambic style, which is more sort of concise and more pungent, was more suited to comedy. And so, and, and again, uh, because of that style and because of that meter, uh, it, it allowed uh, the use of more sort of jargon, short um, uh, exclamations, you know, things that you would typically not use in, in, epic, in epic poetry. Furthermore, it, um, the delineation became social in nature as 
um, Gr uh, Greece became more aristocratic, right? So you had the lower classes and the upper uh, classes of society. And upper classes, of course, were gods by definition, and then heroes, you know, people that were important, kings, uh, you know, upper aristocracy, right? So everybody who is a nobleman, uh, they typically play these uh, important roles and they're described in epic, epic terms. You're not gonna see um, Agamemnon in a comedy. Not because he's not funny, but because he, you know, he deserves better. <laughs> but somebody like uh, uh, um, Thersides, who is a, uh, a common man who challenges Odysseus and challenges the whole idea of um, uh, Trojan War, he is going to be represented in this grotesque and um, a different way. And most likely, he's going to be relegated to a comedy, uh, not, not in Homer, but in general, a person from that social strata is going to be represented in a uh, different language and a different setting and in a different style. And so that initial distinction only became greater as sort of the social, the actual social distinctions grew. Now, where um, history threw a monkey wrench into this whole thing was emergence of uh, Christianity. And, uh, and even before that, uh, the Old Testament tradition, which completely uh, challenged all of this and this whole distinction, excuse me, between what, what, what's considered high and low, because its objective was to say that um, the influence and um, sort of the prerogatives of God did, did not have limits. Right? There was nothing that was off limits, and therefore all of life was kind of elevated to this somber, uh, very kind of epic uh, level. So anything you do, and any, anybody who is alive has a potential to be part of this epic scene, which is life. All of life becomes epic because it's all super important. Right? If you, if right. you look at it from this biblical kind of viewpoint, that everything you do echoes in eternity, if you will, uh, then everything is important. So you could be a slave like Ishmael and you make it to the Bible as a, as a protagonist that has a voice, that has a will, that has a, you know, I mean, we have slaves, of course, in, in uh, other places in, in Greek uh, high and low literature, but uh, high and low styles, but they do not have agency and they, they are just there to sort of as a background. They don't really do anything, not anything important anyway. But of course, in the Old Testament, you have, you know, this is kind of blown out of the water. It, it becomes even worse in Christianity, if you will, because now you have uh, God becoming a little baby and, you know, being born and being with donkeys and all this. I mean, it's just like complete insult to the Greeks. And that's what maybe part of, part of the initial re, uh, repellent between, uh, or the, this conflict between classical culture and this emergent new religion was the fact that they did not observe this rigid tradition of high and low. Uh, it, it was it was an insult to them. Like how what, like what do you, what, what's going on here? It's 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 disregarding all of our all of our classifications, all of our notions of what's proper and proper. I mean it's kind of like you know you walk into a uh, you have a tea with the Queen of England and you dress in jeans and, and sneakers. I mean, that's kind of the, the idea of, of, of um, mixing these styles. And so that really counters Aristotle, doesn't it? I mean, in a way, because, because you had the, you had the, um, the bottom, you know, and then the, the same, and then the above, right? Oh, if, right. if I'm remaining that correct, uh, yeah. remembering yeah. that correctly. Yeah. So, so this kind of, that whole narrative actually upends the whole perception of even the way stories were told or understood. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. And then, but then, uh, you know, uh, we don't, Auerbach picks up on the fact that it's not just about, uh, you know, Christian versus pagan. I mean, he then cites many examples where uh, we, we, we saw in the early uh, church fathers where they created their own version of this classical high style uh, and, and it was completely rigid and, and frozen and lifeless. 
it, and it just had the vocabulary of piety, but didn't really have any any life or substance to it. And we talked about, I think last time we talked about some of the um, uh, courtly literature and some of the knights, you know, the knightly literature. And of course, all of that is, yes. is uh, finds its uh, kind of antithesis in uh, Don Quixote, right? Uh, Don Quixote is the character that um, in some ways is kind of a reaction to how lifeless and how uh, silly these things became because they were so uh so rigid and so lifeless they just you know they just repeated these formulas and that's that's really um i guess what our book is describing is literature in general I and mean, the message in general cannot stay for too long within rigid bounds of any kind of formula formulas are bound to be uh broken and and these rigid um, um borders are are typically you know they cannot contain uh any any genre for too long it just breaks out of them because life cannot be constrained life is too random like we said earlier uh it's it's just it just goes everywhere and then it's silly to think that you can constrain it and and more and more you can you can't uh you know create these compartments you can't compartmentalize um life into you know here's what i do that's that's uh, noble and here's what, what what I do is ignoble. I mean, it's you know, modern life is now especially so mixed up, right? There's you know there is no distinction, right? We've completely mixed up these uh, everything: sacred, profane, commonplace, vulgar. Right. It's all it's all in big mix, you know one big uh, mixing pot. Uh, but and that did not happen overnight. It happened over a very long period of time. But that's I think that's where Auerbach is going with it. Very good. So, uh, Eric, uh, do you want to come off mute and uh, ask your question? And then we'll move on after that. Uh, yeah. So my my the thought that popped in my head earlier was. Um, I, uh, Philip said something about a, a modern writer. In our knowledge commonly has an idea of influencing the world. Just, taking Ayn Rand, for example, um, writing in an ideal mode. Did ancient writers in Aristotle's time think of it themselves that way? Is there any evidence that they wrote to influence the world? Or I'm thinking of Sophocles just to make sure that they were the, the most excellent at writing plays and, and winning festivals. Yeah, I, I don't know that they did necessarily because I think they were they were partly after, after winning the, uh, you know, the prize. Uh, and so Aristotle makes a point there. He says, you know, the writers write to please the crowds. Uh, so he does make that point. And that's why we should be doing this and that, you know, that's why he has a recipe because he says that's how you that's how you win the prize. That's how you make good writing that people love. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, Plato might have a point there that they were not really after some idealized um, representation. I can't think of any any play, tragic or otherwise, that concerns itself with some pure ideal. I think it's all about um, either action, as as Aristotle portrays it, like you know, peripeteia, or or some you know uh, discovery. But of course, character develop. You know, character is right in there. So the, the questions of morality, the questions of right and wrong are all intertwined with, with the plot. But I don't know that any of them sat down and said, you know, I'm gonna write this play to, as an as a object lesson, um, necessarily. Uh, I, I'm curious though what, what Aristotle would say about the biblical authors, had he read any of them. I don't know that he read any of them, but um, because they were writing with this kind of ideal in mind, and everything in the Bible is this sort of, you know, harkens back to to the idea of absolute, uh, much mm -hmm. more so than the Greek writing. Maybe that's why it it ultimately it it um, it had the upper hand in some ways. Okay, well, I mean, if there aren't any other questions, I mean, I, I find this really to be fascinating because, like, one of the things they taught us, and the first thing in consulting they taught us was Aristotle's approach to storytelling. That's the reason why, like, I understood it, like, I had an idea of 
his frame framework pretty well. It's because, you know, it's so effective. It's so effective in how it's approached. So, um, so uh, Eric, do you have a follow up question that you wish to ask? Yeah, there's a, a another question about something Philip said. Sure. Uh, you, you mentioned Cervantes. Uh, that also struck me as interesting. I I know from biography that Cervantes was an itinerant act uh, theater troupe um, and constantly rewrote things just to please the audience, but incorporated whatever materials he had on hand or whatever was necessary or whatever would get a laugh. And so it's not surprising to me that that he would have a like a a big axe to grind <laughs> against rigid forms. <laughs> Right. Um, I'm not entirely familiar with what he was parodying. I only uh, read some of Becker's legends in high school, which my teacher told me to throw away, but <laughs> read Cervantes instead. Um, oh yeah, he. Yeah. Uh, and we, we, we like might have. Anyway, a, that's all. Yeah, we might have a session just on on Don Quixote because he is such a, or or maybe we can incorporate him into into today's discussion. Uh, but he is definitely. An answer to the rigidness of, you know, of the um, like the um, Arthurian romances and uh, some of these other, uh, uh, even the the Song of Roland and some of the other uh, early ballads, night, uh, you know, ballads of the knights and some of these uh, troubadour songs of, of nobility and so on, um, because they, while they're interesting, and they are kind of idealized. Um, they very quickly become somewhat tiresome. And, the, and again, the reason why is because they're all very formulaic. They all follow, like you know the end from the beginning. And, and also they, they have sort of these elements of, of, a, of a good story that they're always there. Like I can, I can, make, I can make up an Arthurian romance on the spot probably right now, just because I know what elements typically go into it you know you have an adventure and you go to a lake and you see this damsel sitting by the lake and then she invites it to the castle and you know and then at night she comes in with her sister and you know they have a banquet but you don't do anything naughty you just have a banquet you know while she's sitting there on your bedside and then she tells you to you know uh to, that you need, you need to go on a quest and find you know the holy grail or i mean it's just like it's 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 there's no surprises it's all you know it was very entertaining I'm sure to the to like to to the audiences in, in the Middle Ages, but after a while, everybody understood that it was lacking. It was lacking in in this you know depth and substance, and that's why you know it just was not enough. And then you have somebody like uh, Boccaccio. Maybe this is a good segue into Boccaccio because we you know we finished up with Dante. Boccaccio, of course, builds on what Dante did. Dante really. Again, he mixed up the styles in his great comedy, Divine Comedy, by introducing historical characters uh, in all kinds of situations. And, and it's all part of this, while well, he himself called it the comedy, which of course implies that it's low style, right? But of course, we would not right. think of it as low style. We think of it as absolute epic uh, right. of, of, uh, you know, by any stretch. Of imagination by both the subjects that he's treating and and his manner of, you know, his um, ethos, right, in in writing it. Uh, but he called it the comedy. The only reason, of course, he called it the comedy was because of the again the classical definition of comedy is where you start in a bad spot and you end up in a good spot. So we start in hell, we start in uh, disarray, in sort of this moral decay, and in a forest lost in 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 sin, and then we end up in heaven. Right, and we 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 were we're there with uh, Beatrice and we're with with Mary and with God and everything is great, uh, but but he took you know he took the language and the settings of common people, common places, even animals, his observations of nature. I mean, all the contemporary or almost contemporary historical accounts, which again never really make it into should never make it into epic uh, settings, and he mixed them all up together. Plus, he, you know, uh, threw in some, some uh, uh, farcical and grotesque features in hell, uh, but but still, it's all it's all there. Um, and then Boccaccio comes along, and he builds on that. And of course, it was all written in in Italian. So the again the the break with with Latin as the 
only language that you can write serious literature in, that was in itself a huge, huge um, departure. Uh, but then you have Boccaccio and he takes this idea of mixing up high and low, but he, uh, he writes, you know, not in an epic, he writes in this middle uh, style, which is neither low nor high. And it's dealing with these, um, uh, his audience is not, not necessarily aristocratic, but not necessarily peasants either. They're this, you know, these young people that are probably from well-to-do families. And he describes life, but the way he describes it is without the, um, this disdain for common things and things that we go through. Instead, he elevates uh, common situations with humor, even situations, in, you know, even including some of his er erotica that pervades uh, Decameron, it's still part of life. And, and it's uh, in some ways a celebration of life. Of course, you know, we have to remember that it was written during uh, the, uh, the plague. And so the, the whole idea is that, you, you know, you're on the doorstep of eternity and, and death and, um, you want to celebrate life. And maybe that's why his, you know, his okay. literature was so, um, uh, was so elevating and so uplifting. Uh, but he did for, for middle, um, middle style what, what, what uh, Dante did for epic style. And of course he did it also in Italian and, and expanded kind of the reaches of, of uh, literature in, in, in kind of mixing up these ideas, these, you know, false dichotomies of, of high and low. And that's why the Cameron is, is this kind of, again, uh, a blow to Aristotle because it's neither here nor there. It's, it's, it takes the middle road and it does it in, in, in this really uh, wonderful, ingenious way. And a lot of his stories are tragic. A lot of them are, are comic and it's all in one, one book, right? It's, you know, some of his stories are quite tragic. Uh, I mean, almost, uh, you know, you want to like cry <laughs> as you read some of them. They're so, you know, so uh, emotive, but, but a lot of them mm. are quite farcical and, and, and hilarious. And it's all part of, but it's all written kind of the same in the same style. That's, that's, um, that's uplifting. So, so that's Boccaccio. And he, again, he, he does, he continues this uh, kind of, uh, what's the word? Um, he continues to destroy these these uh, boundaries, and then of course um, <clears throat> the next one that we come to. I'm, I'm I'm skipping over a little bit here, but the next uh, big uh, uh, giant of a writer is Shakespeare. Shakespeare is interesting because he, um, while he continues this tradition of mixing things that are quote, appropriate to high and low styles, he's definitely writing for aristocracy. And I, I just double check to make sure I'm not out of line here. If you look at the protagonist of Shakespeare, it's pretty clear that we're back to um, kind of this uh, classical definition of, of high style, because who mm -hmm. are they? They're all kings, right? Prince Henry, King Lear, Hamlet, I mean, you just, you just Macbeth. I mean, it's it's Macbeth, all like yeah. uh, you know, you don't have a story of um, you know uh, a servant girl, <laughs> you know? and even when you have these characters that are from uh, lower classes, they're not depicted as heroes anymore. So, like Shylock is often cited as a counterexample, but Shylock is not um, somebody that you want to be necessarily, as opposed to Hamlet, right? He's not a person that you want to necessarily aspire to be. Uh, so, so you do have that. But at the same time, at the same time, he does mix and match. You know, he mixes jesters, right? Who are typically, you know, they don't really participate in anything. You don't like in the in the Song of Roland. You don't. You wouldn't. You wouldn't have an arm bearer all of a sudden. Oh, by the way you know, uh, Roland, how could you, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it just would not happen because yeah. that's not, the, you know, arm bearers do not have a voice, but in King Lear, a jester has an amazing voice and he is important to, to the, to the story. And you have, so you have these 
you know, kind of secondary characters that are mixed up with the quote, the great characters. So that's both democratizing, but it's also in some ways a step back because again, the, who are the protagonists? Who, are, who is the audience he's writing uh, for, right? He's not writing for peasants. He's writing for Queen Elizabeth <laughs> or for somebody like that, you know, for, for aristocracy. And of course, because of that, he has to appeal to the, um, the aesthetic of that class. So the social, um, uh, the classes of, of Britain at that point, uh, they definitely have their influence on him. Uh, I'll stop here. Uh, actually, there's a hand. Yeah, so we actually have uh, Andrea with, a, with her hand up. So, uh, if anybody else has a question, maybe they want to follow up on about uh, Shakespeare or Boccaccio. Uh, type exclamation point in chat and raise your hand in Zoom. Go ahead, and Andrea. So I, I think I'm probably not supposed to ask this kind of question, but I was kind of like doing a little bit of research um, about uh, basically how did Aristotle like feed himself? <laughs> so, um, which I think, you know, I, there's a term for this and I can never remember what it is, but it's like, you know, considering the person when you really shouldn't be considering the person um, in terms of evaluating what they've written. But it said that um, initially he was sent away to school. So um, that meant that he would probably be writing for an audience um, that consisted of people that were similar in background. Um, so if he was sent away to school, one would assume that he was either really smart or he came from a reasonably wealthy family. And then apparently he was a tutor for the son of some uh, royalty member that uh, and the son eventually became Alexander the Great. Yes. So um, <laughs> in terms of, you know, are you going back to my question about what's the purpose of the writing and, you know, how do you architect it? Um, assuming that you're also to some degree writing to support yourself, which I think is something often we're not, like my philosophy group in Tucson, everybody's like, oh, that doesn't matter that every philosopher that we've discussed was dumped by his girlfriend, but, you know, it, it wow. does to some degree. So right. Right. are we supposed well, I, I to consider a, that or not? Uh, yeah, I think it's an obvious and important question to ask. Uh, and all, you know, initially maybe a forgotten question that we were not asking uh, or we started asking not too long ago with this whole idea of deconstruction, right? So you want to understand uh, the background of the person that's, that's writing because it colors his perception, right? And, and who, who he is writing for. I mean, this is true of, um, of, of writers, it's true uh, of, of artists, uh, uh, visual artists of anybody, right? Musicians, et cetera. It always, it's always important to understand the audience that you are uh, performing for and creating for. On the other side, I do want to say this, and maybe I'm, this is maybe my own opinion, not necessarily uh, uh, some sort of scholarly um, consensus, but I, I can't escape the, the feeling that if you are um, somewhat um, self-reliant and, and you have spare income as most of these uh, you know, philosophers did, right? They're all reclining there. They're going from banquet to banquet, like you know, Plato and, and probably Aristotle too. Uh, if you do have that, then you're not as dependent on uh, a patron who is going to dictate to you what you need to write. And I mean, again, you know, you can always say, well, what about Dante? Dante, you know, was exiled and then he was given um, uh, a place to stay where he worked uh, for the rest of his life. But did he write? Uh, and of course, he... he uh, in some ways, he was explicit that he wanted, he, uh, he co not concentrated, but he dedicated his, he has a, like a letter of dedication to this prince that he was writing. Uh, I think it was, um, the name escapes him, but anyway, one of the counts uh, in Italy at the, at the time. But does that mean that he, everything he, he wrote was, was to tr somehow create a favorable um, opinion of himself in, in, in uh, before that other person. I, I really, to me, that's a stretch. That's taking it too far. So you have to understand it. You have to be cognizant of it. 
but I don't think it necessarily is the determining factor uh, of, of everything. So yes, it's a good question. Like how, you know, did they write to support themselves? Did they, what was the objective? But you can't take it too far. Sometimes you have to take it on their own merits. And also I'll, I'll say this too. A lot of times people write something and their writing uh, takes on a life of its own, maybe, maybe a life that they never intended it to have. So I, I, take, I take most of the writing of Aristotle and Plato at its face value. I, I eva- try to evaluate it on its own merits, not on the merits of what they were trying to do. So I don't know if that's helpful or not. But. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Next up, we have Madeline. Yes, uh, on the topic of uh, the author income, I'm thinking of both Cervantes and Shakespeare um, mixing high and low. They were both people who had day jobs. Uh, Cervantes, I think, was a tax collector or naval accountant, something like that, military something. He had a long, Uh, illustrious career. (laughs) Yeah, he did a lot. (laughs) and, uh, And Shakespeare had a theater. Yep. You know, he had an acting company. He had a whole business going. Uh, and so I'm wondering if uh, those who weren't of the moneyed class tended to be those who were going to mix the genres more. Hmm. Just wondering what anyone else thinks. That's an interesting question. Ability, yeah, I'm sure you, you can have examples on either side of that, though. I don't know that you can do that because, again, you have modern writers who are um, mixing everything and they, they can support themselves. But is that the reason or is it because the prevailing winds are such that that's just how we think about reality? I tend to start from a kind of more philosophical position that they wrote the way they wrote because uh, that's how they saw the world. And, you know, so they just basically wrote in a way that they themselves saw the world, that their representation is essentially using Barfield's uh, term is um, a reflection of their own consciousness, right? So the the way they were conscious of the world, that's how they wrote. Uh, So when Homer writes in his somewhat um, uh, high style, that's, you know, beginning to crystallize into a classical epic poetry, is he writing about a rose-cheeked Hera and, um, you know, uh, dark-haired Poseidon because he's trying to please somebody or is he just, that's just his perception or that's what he always heard as a child or that's how he grew up and that's how he pictures it. I kind of tend to go with the latter. Maybe I'm a little bit idealistic here, but I, I tend to think that we write and we think the way we tend to perceive the world. So the, the, the reason why, why we're so cynical today is because that's how we perceive the world as, as uh, more cynical. And if we were in an earlier time, we, you know, we would never ask this question because that would be kind of insulting to the, uh, to the writers. But today we are fine asking these questions because that's just the way the world works for us. So Margaret, you have your physical hand up, literally. <laughs> so I was just... Uh, like kind of curious to know if you actually have a question or if you're just stretching. Well, I had a response to that question, but I am a little new to this version of Zoom. So I don't know if I'm in line and waiting not, for other people. Go right ahead. Okay, go ahead. thank you. No, thank you. Go right ahead. And I, I just have to say these meetings are making my head spin so that I really can't guarantee probably for a long time that I'm going to be concise and make as much sense as I want to because just do your best just do your yeah best. Be like you, your mind just goes in a million directions it's really exciting I'm just thinking of a fraction of the response that I had to to your question person who just asked um for instance, I saw, I, I, I was talking to someone and realizing that I have certain really fervent beliefs that are, seem really um, distinct to me. I don't 
and and they're pretty cynical, I got to say, about the world and the way it works. Mm -hmm. And I realized during this conversation that it was Sartre novels that I read in college. And it's as if he just reached down and rearranged my whole soul and my mind. And my mind just started looking at the world the way he did. And he's not the only author that I read when I was in college. But what's so cool about the web is you can just press a button and see a documentary on Sartre and learn so much more about why he was as cynical as he was because he was surviving the war, you know? And right. he just went through all of those ups and downs of being you know, what he was saying wasn't getting across. Then it started to get across. Then he became really popular. Then he became a hero. And there are so many figures who have said something that's true to their heart and they end up being exiled. You know, Victor Hugo, um, the guy who wrote um, The Importance of Being Earnest, just like there are certain driving forces that make somebody be so honest that they don't, they, they can't worry about the circumstances of how they're going to be so, affected by what they write. Thanks. It's, a, it's a interesting. Uh, so does Arabach actually talk about Sartre or anybody that modern? Uh, no, yeah, it's I modern. Think, Sorry. Uh, before, before that, um, uh, if I remember, actually, I think Virginia Woolf is, I think either the last author or right before the last. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, so we have, we have quite, uh, quite a ways to go yet. Um, but I was curious if there are any more questions on, or, or the thoughts on, on Shakespeare and Boccaccio. Well, I'm just interested in actually knowing a little bit more about um, maybe again, Aristotle's way of telling stories and how that relates to Shakespeare's, essentially, you know, his comedies, his tragedies, you know, and how they actually lined up with one another, because there seems to be a lot of overlap. I mean, from when I've read, when I read, you know, what I've read of Shakespeare, everything seems like an Aristotelian kind of format. It, it absolutely uh, it, is. So, I mean, that, that seems like there's a heavy influence when you're talking think, about fact, Aristotle's yeah, form yeah, of I, comedy. I think, mm -hmm. I think if we, you know, if you want to pin down kind of the beginning of neoclassicism, maybe Shakespeare is that point. Because, right. um, you know, if you look at Aristotle's prescription for a great, uh, a great play, and then you look at what Shakespeare actually did, I mean, he is following that recipe to the T. Exactly. Mean, with, with everything, right? With, with the story. By the way, the, incidentally, of course, the word for story is muthos or mythos. Um, so the mythology, right, you start with that. And Shakespeare has great stories, right? So the plot line That's itself right. is wonderful. Then you have the second one is character or ethos or ethe. Um, and what great characters are in Shakespeare, right? Hamlet, right? You can, I mean, we know, we know Shakespeare by his characters because they're so deeply developed. And um, and maybe maybe that's the only departure I would say from from um, Aristotle in, in, is in that sometimes he gives too much room for character development. Of course, for us it would be just enough or, or, or perfectly right. come out because we want to see inside of them. We want to see inside of Hamlet. We want to see inside of Lady Macbeth and, and so on. Uh, but but to Aristotle maybe it was like okay maybe maybe just just enough. Uh, with that, uh, and of course, the third one is Lexis, which is the lexicon or, or the diction. Yeah. Lexicon. Well, we know what Shakespeare did for English language. I mean, he right. he completely reinvented it, right? And his vocabulary is what, like twenty thousand words or some insane number like that. Uh, so uh, then you have the next one, which is thought, thoughtfulness of involved in in the development of the plot, and that's your uh, the Greek word is dianoia. The annoy and I thought that was, that was what I was what I thought it was theme. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's thought or, or or contemplation or just kind of the idea of uh, okay. what what's the thought behind the plot, right? The kind of the philosophical underpinning of it. Well, that's that's clear. Uh, Opsis, uh, the spectacle, right? The spectacle part of it is wonderful, right? Think of 
Atello or or any, I mean, all of them. They really have an amazing. Yeah. How would you un, like unveil, like uh, uh, unveil the the you know the the, the you know the, the unraveling part of it uh, of the story? Is it, absolutely, it, it, right. Well, the unraveling better. that's the plot, right? So the plot has the peripatia and the the um like the recess, right? The discovery. Uh, but the actual um, I guess why why do so many actors love to perform? Shakespearean plays because there's so much room for spectacle, right? There's so much uh, room for this performance uh, that he leave, he gives you, right? With 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 the uh, even the side characters, and not even the main characters, like absolutely. all the characters. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, and then finally, the poetic quality, right? The melopoeia. Uh, so that's that's amazing. Uh, the 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 wonderful richness of the language, the verse, the I mean that's why we memorize Shakespeare is because it's beautiful. So on all of the all of the constituents of Aristotle, I think Shakespeare scores off the charts easily. So in that regard, he follows him to the T. Now where he departs from him a little bit is again is is perhaps an introduction of these uh, situations or people. Or, or uh, one notable thing, I guess, uh, would be even things like nature. In in uh, King Lear, you know, Tempest is almost a character in the play, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a departure from from Aristotle. Aristotle would never introduce a non-human character into the into this uh, scheme. Uh, so so that you know that that's an interesting. So he obviously introduces new things. And he introduces new characters like jesters, and he introduces these uh, people from the lower classes that have their own voice, sometimes a voice of sarcasm, sometimes a voice of reason. Um, you know, you have Hamlet has his friends, and you have uh, Horatio, and you have like, you know, this, there's all kinds of these uh, uh, sidekicks, right, that, that play a huge role. Right. In, in, in Shakespearean plays, and Aristotle might say, "Well, that's not really good for, for the epic type of writing or or uh, uh, tragedy because it kind of lowers its pathos, right? It's uh, it's high, but it, but it doesn't do anything of the sort. In fact, it makes it more more tragic because it's more believable, it's more more uh, realistic. So that I think that, that that's how I would characterize it. Um, so." I believe Katie had a question in the chat, and uh, I don't know if Madeline still has a question, but if not, then we, we can uh, follow Going on. back to something you said earlier about you believe that 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 literature is reflecting reality as how or how we perceive reality, and I think that relates to something that someone else had said uh, in a different meetup that. It's 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 we're using we're using metaphor like the metaphor idea like we're using things that we know we we can't use things that we, we can't picture what we don't know like, so we have to use it's like this which is something we know or then you know, we kind of then we play with the it's like we play with it a little bit in different directions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, that that was a whole subject of our conversation on um, poetic diction by Barfield, and of course, he, uh, he makes this point that metaphors are a foundational device in poetry that, in fact, makes this uh, felt change in consciousness, uh, and, and it's definitely one of the devices that that's used uh, to bridge the gap, and to, like you said, to to describe something that we don't have access to through what we, we, we know, right? Dante is a master of these metaphors and similes specifically. I mean, he has hundreds and hundreds of similes uh, in, in, in the Commedia and they're amazing similes, um, all of them. So yeah, so those, all of those devices definitely, uh, definitely play a huge part in, in, in Mimesis because it, it, it definitely helps us bridge the gap. I would say they fall under the, um, either the uh, melopoeia, which is this, uh, the, the song or the, the beautiful verse or the, the lexicon part of the, um, kind of the, in, in, in this Aristotelian framework anyway. 
Yeah, actually, we were just in a meetup actually talking about the power of money floors uh, during our uh, last Buckminster Fuller meetup. So um, as far as communicating ideas uh, to to individuals, um, so to specifically, uh, you know, senior executives so that they could grasp a, a concept. Um, but in any case, uh, do you want to continue to move on or would you, are there any other questions? Uh, that anybody has. I mean, if not, I well, we could make a couple could, comments as well. Yeah, we could we could move on to um, to Cervantes. Um, okay. As a as a because we we have we have enough time, so yeah, let's do that. Yeah. And so right, so with Cervantes, uh, Don Quixote, we again we are uh, in conversation with this uh, idea of high style and specifically this kind of a formulaic. A version of it. And um, of course, the plot of Don Quixote is all about him going mad based on reading all of these uh, uh, night uh, stories of the knights and try and imagining himself to be one of them, one of the knights. Of course, what is interesting is that uh, what makes him uh, kind of this epic tragic hero is that he actually believes it and he is a good person at heart while he is completely deluded <laughs> about the you know the objective material of the world he is at the same time uh, uh sincere in his delusion and that of course is what gives it not only a farcical value but actual uh serious tragic value epic value and and, and in the end when he is uh he re finally recognizes his madness and he dies sh shortly thereafter we can't escape this feeling that he lost something when he uh, went sane again. So when he was insane, he was kind of endearing and funny and we, we started to kind of like him, his madness. There was method in, in, in his madness. But then when he uh, recovers his sanity, he becomes like the rest of us. And he loses, it seems, the impetus for you know, living any, any longer and he, he dies. Uh, I mean, the two the, you can't escape the connection between the two events that he, that his sanity and his death are connected somehow. Uh, but in in between those two, uh, the polemic of Cervantes is is with this idea of reality. What is it? Is it something that we see objectively, or is it something that is in our minds ultimately? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a very deep question that. Uh, obviously contradicts Aristotle because it, it it ignores what's on the outside and it dives straight into our consciousness and what, what's going on there. So Don Quixote lives in his own mind. Everybody else lives by what they see, but he lives by what he thinks about what he sees. And he creates his own reality that's in conflict with everyone else's. And so in this case, mimesis is, you know, is taken on a completely new dimension which is a dimension of our inner consciousness. That's something that has not really happened until that point. So in, in that way, Cervantes is a complete um, kind of a, a, a pathfinder, if you will, of new, you know, new directions in, in, in mimesis because he's the first one to actually do this uh, analysis of the, of the person from their own standpoint. And, and he, creation of reality, if you will, from, from inside their head, <laughs> based on what they've mm. read in this case. Uh, so this is, you know, it's, it's a, this is the, the beginning of that path. Of course, we find it in modern literature, it, it's everywhere, right? It, it's, you know, we, I mean, Virginia Woolf does exactly the same thing with her characters. They are create, they're telling us what's going on. In, they're, opening the door to their consciousness and we see what's going on inside there but that's that's the world that we're seeing is the world of their consciousness that they're creating whether it's real or not real as you know you can debate about that i mean obviously it's more real than don quixote's world but the point is it's the same kind of thing it's the world of ideas the world of thought the world of idealism and maybe maybe that is a, uh, is a connection to Plato, right? Because Plato... that's what I was going to say the world of forms in a the way. That's the you know, forum. So that's where I I was thinking where you were going with that actually. So yeah. that's more of a connection with Plato than it is actually the Aristotelian right. approach, right. especially if you're looking from the inside. Uh, from the, 
from uh, as opposed to externals. Yeah. So that's that's and of course, I mean, as far as low and high style, well, again, Cervantes, you know, this is farcical, this is tragic, this is comedic. Uh, you know, we we're, we're there with um, swine herding um, uh, shepherd girls, but they're not the girls of the pastorellas, right? The kind of the I I idyllic version of of a shepherd and a and a and an idyllic version of a sheep that is like all fluffy and white and not smelly at all. No, we're right there with the smelly, you know, uh, pigs and, and swine and um, <laughs> and sh uh, sheep and just, I mean, it's just a mess. Uh, and you have, you have the two worlds put side by side. You have the shining world of Don Quixote in, in his mind. And of course he sees everything in the shiny, shiny uh, uh, sort of uh, illumination. And then you have the, uh, right there, you know, you have, um, his servant uh, Sancho Panza, and he sees it as it is, uh, with with the, the sort of the the smell and everything, and the two are in collision on a collision course all the time. So if there was ever a picture of the high style and the low style colliding, there it is right there in Cervantes, uh, you know, pictured large, writ large for us. So that's um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> so. Uh, Madeline, and then we have uh, Shrikant, who's back. Yes, uh, well, um, <clears throat> Phil, what you were saying about uh, Don Quixote and his delusions, I was thinking about, and um, Katie's thing that she said about perception, so I was thinking about verification, verification of reality. And uh, this took place right around the same time as this entire current of thought in Europe. Uh, the same one that led to the formation of the Royal Society in England, like Boyle and Hook. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, sort of what is real? How do you verify it? Do you need witnesses? Um, and just from what you're saying about Don Quixote, apparently uh, when we do find out what is real, it's so unbearable that we just give up and die. Although his servant doesn't. His servant knew this all along. Uh, yeah, that was it. I just, I thought it was interesting because it's, this whole thing doesn't really rise in medieval literature. Uh, were you referring to somebody like Descartes? And his sort of uh, skepticism, starting with you know, yeah. the demon inside your head, and kind of yeah, it could be. I was thinking more of a little bit later than that, uh, right around the time of uh, Cervantes, um, when the when the scientific method got going in England, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which had to do with with observation, measurement, verification. So the, the subjectivity of alchemy was out the door. Well, alchemy was easier because it's kind of on the outside, but what's on, in, on the inside, I don't think, <laughs> it's easy. And I don't think uh, the science, science can help us a whole lot there because I think, what, I, I think it's a bit later, but it was, I think it's in the 17, I think it's 1700s or, or right about that time when you have um, Berkeley, George um, Berkeley, uh, a philosopher, yeah who basically post, well, suggested this idea of solipsism. They were all just dreaming. And you know, it's, it's, nobody really accepts this, but nobody can disprove it either scientifically. It's, it's not a, something you can disprove. So it's not as easy to verify, as you say, uh, what's actually real. That, that's what makes it interesting. Uh, what's, you know, you, you can disprove what's on the outside, objective reality pretty easily, but, you can't really tell Don Quixote that he's not seeing what he's seeing. Because you don't, first of all, you don't have access to that. Secondly, how do you know <laughs> that what you're seeing is not, not real, right? So it's, it's a little bit harder question and they definitely didn't have the tools and thank God they didn't have the tools because they had imagination to ask these types of questions uh, in a poetic form, uh, in a fictional form that I think is much more powerful in terms of framing these questions, uh, what is real? And what is what takes precedence? Um, and I honestly, I I'm not sure. I, I know I, 
I don't have an answer to that either. I, sometimes I, I am right there with Don Quixote. I want to create my own reality and run away into it because that creative reality is much more cozy than what I see on the outside. And maybe that's what he was doing. You know, this is kind of escapism. I think we started with that uh, earlier, but yeah. So I'm going to be handing this off to Srikant, somebody that's much more capable uh, to, to uh, run this meetup. So, and uh, so I'm going to leave it off to Srikant and then Jang is next in the queue. And okay. I don't believe we have any, I don't believe we have anybody in the chat. Thank you. So we'll go with Jang and then I have a comment on, I have a question about Cervantes. So uh, Jang, go ahead. I, yeah, I do too. Yeah, so this is quite fascinating because um, I was wondering about, you know, like um, what is real, you know, before before I was always think I'm Western thinking even I grew up in China. So believe in Plato, there's ultimate truth behind everything. But gradually I realized maybe not, you know, it's, our, it's a more about our understanding, you know, how we see things. I think I grew up reading a lot of like novels and movie, watch a lot of movies and make life much more colorful. But <laughs> later on realized like Gone with the Wind is now I read in high school. And the funny thing I real later learned, usually people put what they cannot realize in real life in the novel, the ideal way of <laughs> things. So Gone with the Wind, the real story I learned is like the, the guy, he basically makes the best quality of the, the husband, the lover, and into this, uh, the main character. And so that's, and uh, in real life, it's totally opposite. So it's kind of very disappointing to know, you know, what you used to believe this ideal way of life, and it's all fake. And it's like, then you have this ironic, and even the medicine bridge, you know, it's like they have this, when you're seeing a real life, it's just a pathetic, you know, it's not real, it's impossible. So it's like made, <laughs> made age wife, housewife in the kitchen and imagine this splendid love story. <laughs> it's not even possible. But anyway, it, I think it's sad, like, but at the same time, you know, like, I still love watching movies because, you know, otherwise life, if you see in this more realistic way, it's not fun anymore. Like, movie make it much more fun. So I think it's kind of like the balance, you cannot totally live in fiction, but you cannot afford to only live in reality because it's too boring. So it's kind of like a fine line to live yeah, it in. It depends on where you live. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I, I, I have to tell you, um, I have some of my friends um, who live in Russia and they tell me, I could write a book that will blow of my life that will blow away Dostoevsky or, or Tolstoy. So meaning that their life is so unpredictable and so, there's so many turns and so many peripeteas and reversals and, you know, uh, uh, anagnoreses that you can write 10 books, you know, uh, so it's not boring for everybody. Let's put it this way. I think it's more boring for us in the Western world where it's all kind of comfortable and safe, but um, yeah, anyway. Right. Um, so, Phil, uh, I'm sorry to have missed this part. I'm going to catch up on it, but I'm really. Uh, I just want to. We just. We just want. Just want to look at Cervantes because, in some ways, he's a transition. He's mm -hmm. a transitional figure. He's. He's like he stands between the ancient sensibility and the modern sensibility. It stands between the move from kind of reality to more subjectivist expression. Um, so he's a, he's a key figure, you know, also in terms of just innovation of writing a novel, you know, it's, it's just incredible. You know, it's like, he, he's, he's a, like a fulcrum, you know, there is the time, the modern time on this side and the ancient time on that side. Um, so now I do not have a good grasp of our box work and what he has done. So can you talk a little bit about how Orbach does, handles everything before Cervantes so far and how he's going to handle everything after this? What's, what are the kind of large scale patterns that you see or that he talks about in the modern 
modern uh, sensibility, the modern expression, as opposed to the ancient expression. Right. So I think I think maybe the, the biggest pattern is the switch from emphasis on what's happening on the outside and what's happening on the inside. I think that probably is the biggest transition because everything we've looked, I mean, let, let's think about who we looked at first of all. So we looked at the classical authors, right? You know, Homer, uh, we looked at the biblical authors, we looked at uh, some of the ro late Roman uh, Hellenistic authors, we looked at uh, uh, Gregory of Tours and History of the Franks. We looked at Song of Roland. We looked at the courtly. So everything we've looked at, if you think about it, most of what we're reading about there is things that are happening to the protagonist. Th meaning, thing, when I say things that are happening, most of it, again, not, I know there are counterexamples, but most of what's happening is these peripeties, these discoveries and, and reversals of fortune that are happening primarily, or they start with things that happen to you external things that happen to you, right? You're the object and something happens to you, whether through other people or through uh, forces of nature or whatever it is, but things happen to you on the outside. That might trigger something in, in, internal, but that's kind of incidental. And that's what we talked about earlier, Shrikan, before you joined us, that Aristotle, he postulated that the uh, principal focus of a fiction writer should be plot, should be action. Action should be paramount. But character development should be secondary to that. And it's only as a kind of adjunct, uh, 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 not central. Now, Cervantes breaks with that because what, what, what's happening on the outside is completely trivial. What's happening inside is paramount. So he completely reverses that. And from that point on, I would say probably most of what we're reading about, including Faust, including um, most of the other uh, authors is the primacy really is on what is happening on the inside. Now, of course, that doesn't mean the plot goes away. The plot never goes away. I mean, think of War and Peace. Obviously, it's all set. The background is his, huge, huge historical upheavals and, and wars and so on. But how much of um, Tolstoy is spent describing what this character is thinking, what he's struggling with. I mean, Dostoevsky makes it, you know, completely extreme where pages and pages and pages are spent in this inner monologue. Uh, same with Faust, same with, you know, a lot of these other characters. And that becomes the, the important thing. And of course, we finish with Virginia Woolf and her To the Lighthouse, where it's completely taken over the plot. The plot is extinguished. <laughs> We're just sitting around doing nothing. We're just... We're mending, we're mending the sock <laughs> for, for, for three chapters or whatnot. And while we're mending the sock, entire life is, is, is described that's happening inside, right? So that, I would say that's the, I would say the big picture, that's, that's the pattern. Wonderful, wonderful. So we'll go with Joe next. Um, Phil, I know you need to leave by 11 o'clock. So don't worry, we'll, we'll, I will. Okay, sure. There. sure. And then, uh, folks, we're going to be talking about what we are doing with the Bucky series. I want to talk, tell, tell you about it because this is very core to our comprehensivist uh, endeavor. So, uh, Joe, you're next. Uh, you know, actually, you really just kind of nailed what I was about to ask about. It was essentially this shift from a mythos kind of a perspective, um, you know, to more of a modern way of telling stories. Uh, so you kind of already have alluded and answered my question too. So I, I, I don't have much to add to that. Uh, it, it was, you know, kind of this, the, the idea of the plot actually changing. Uh, Wonderful. So then yeah, let, so. let me, then let me, I, I'm really dying to ask Phil a few <laughs> questions uh, about, about what is coming up, because I want to give people a heads up on what, uh, you know, what uh, our book is going to do in the rest for the rest. So could you talk about the highlights that are coming up, what you would like to do next, how, you know, on, on our book? Uh, so just- yeah, I think, I, I mean, there are a couple of things we can do. I, I, I think we can maybe have one more meetup that just talks sp about specific works and we can finish with that. And then I don't know if we want to have another meeting just looking back over the entire thing and just kind of summarizing it. Sure. But um, 
you know, what's coming up next, I mean, um, he has a really interesting chapter on Rabelais, uh, Gurgantuan uh, Pantagruel. He has an interesting chapter on Montaigne. Uh, he has an interesting chapter on uh, some of the uh, uh, French writers like Stendhal, Balzac. Um, uh, so yeah, we, we can definitely go over some of those. Uh, and then I think the high point though is um, is Virginia Woolf and and, the, and the, this idea of stream of consciousness. I mean, he mentions other other works in conjunction with that, like uh, James Joyce's uh, Ulysses. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's kind of the you know where where we end up. So we started all the way with with Homer and we end up with uh, Virginia Woolf as, as kind of the epitome of modern writing. Of course, you have to remember, um, oh, Proust is another one that he, uh, he mentions uh, as well, I think is worth mentioning, it's very interesting. Um, so yeah, you have to remember that, of course, this was written in, I think, 44 or 46, 1944, 1946, something like that. So it's obviously, you know, this is up to his, up to the point of, Basically, you know, majority of people that literally lived maybe 20 years before this this book uh, came out. So he he wasn't he didn't have access to some of the more modern mm -hmm. writers. But I think it gives us a really good uh, good feeling as to uh, where things are going. And I would say that it pretty much summarizes everything up to the modern period. Oh, of course, of course, he does um, dwell a little bit on Dostoevsky, not a whole lot, unfortunately. I wish he had devoted more time to him, but. Uh, we can talk about Dostoevsky as well. So, Phil, one more question, kind of a larger question here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been wonderful having you talk about, firstly, with, you know, Dante and Dostoevsky and Faust, and then with Orbach and Owen Barfield. Okay. Um, I think... Owen Barfield and Orbach are very special. I mean, the, the appreciation you get for what language is and how it is tied to our consciousness, how our use of language shapes the consciousness and how our consciousness shapes the language and how it is different over time and different cultures. But it's just fascinating, fascinating stuff. So firstly, thank you very much for, for you know, exposing all of us to that uh, because this is something that we use all the time you know we consider it to be just taken for granted you know but this is this actually shows us how it came to be how it actually works what are the different options uh, it allows you at, uh, I mean I, I do like uh, Owen Barfield a lot of just kind of him saying that reading some something, from another time actually gives you an idea of what that consciousness was like. And you can't really get that any other way. Uh, you know, you get that through art of different kinds, but I think the, the language, so firstly, thank you very much. So on that front, what else can we explore <laughs> going further? Um, yeah, it kind of put me on the spot because I, I have been thinking about it, uh, but it's, I have to be honest though, Coming up with somebody on the same level as Barfield or Auerbach is not an easy. Yes. Uh, it's not an easy task. So I'll have to I'll have to get back to you on it. I have a couple of yeah. thoughts, but I don't have anybody that just jumps out at me and says, screams that you know we have to do this this one next because it's like I said it's, I don't want to now that we've set the bar uh, somewhat high, I don't want to uh, lower it. Uh, I want to sure think of a thinker that's of equal you know, magnitude and um, influence, and it's not going to be uh, easy to find. Uh, but also sure. that needs to have kind of a more comprehensive uh, outlook on not just kind of a narrow point perspective on something, but more kind of comprehensive like that. I mean, with, with the writers, it's easier because um, I think both Dostoevsky and Tolstoy are easily uh, the same caliber writers as Dante, for instance, but they're not philosophers per se. Uh, we can maybe have a talk about uh, Dostoevsky as a philosopher and maybe Tolstoy as a philosopher, but that's, um, yeah, that's a... Yeah, I mean, there are multiple ways. I mean, the good thing is that this meetup format is very flexible, mm -hmm. so we can approach it in multiple ways. Like you can take different themes, like 
you know, you can pick up metaphors and br bring what a whole bunch of people have said mm -hmm. about metaphors. So we can take, you know, we can go by the theme. Uh, so there are all kinds of possibilities, but please do think about it because, uh, it, and it doesn't have to be another thinker. It can be anything on language because I, I, you know, I'm just tremendously fascinated with language. You know, when I went through these uh, 103 great ideas, language is the idea that I've really found the most fascinating and most complex and most difficult uh, to to grapple with. So, so anything, anything on that um, okay. would be great. All right. Um, let's see. We've got seven more minutes. Uh, Phil, any more? You want to make any more comments? Anything? Uh... You know what? Let, let, let's give a chance. It, it's only seven minutes. So, folks, if you can talk about what Phil's meetups on Orbach and um, Barfield have done for you. You know, what have you learned about language through all of that? Just very briefly, like one or two minutes, um, just go ahead and type an exclamation mark. What, what do you think? What have you learned about language and what has it done for you? So go ahead and type an exclamation mark if you'd like to share. Uh, we'll start with uh, Joe. Joe, go ahead. So, I mean, I think that one of the most powerful things is you start to see the power of metaphors uh, and the way words are used and woven into stories and how a story is actually told and how the language is actually uh, kind of shapes the person's perspective on how their, their perspective on the world, essentially. Um, and since, and there's these different forms of storytelling and how these actually, uh, one of the things that I find to be most interesting is how they, uh, that the imitation factor of how stories build on one another and then what they try to communicate, the deep concepts that they try to communicate, especially going back from the Greeks actually till today and how there's the distinction between the inner and outer that you made this evening was very uh, profound um, because you know that's 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 a that's a clear delineation um, of how people um, you know thought about the world uh, when you started thinking about inside um, it completely changes the way stories are told um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I, I hope we do something next with the use of metaphors, because I think that that actually could be a, a really interesting thing that they're so powerful and how they still impact our lives and how they impact language. Like the the just how a word, a metaphor and a concept, actually how they, they impact the way we actually interact with each other and communicate different ideas. Um, you know, we had a meetup, a short meetup on language here, uh, you know, just how words can, um, a word can, like elasticity could actually, how it could turn into so many different concepts and so many different metaphors. So anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. Next up is Margaret. Margaret, go ahead. I'm kind of uh, summarizing what the gentleman just said. It's it's like the history of creativity and the history of the control of creativity. Really amazing, just amazing talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. All right, folks. So thank you very much. So we, what we'll do is that we're going to close off this meetup. Uh, thank you, Phil. Uh, look forward to having you one month from now. Uh, folks, the schedule for the Comprehensivist Wednesdays is that first Wednesday of the month, it is Mike doing improv. Second is Maritza talking about Bucky's ideas, and we will be talking about that in a moment. Third, third Wednesday, we have Sanjay doing neuroscience, and fourth Wednesday, we have Phil doing something on language or anything else that he wants to do. So that's that is the that is the plan, um, and it's wonderful. Oh wait a minute, Maritza, you have something. Been okay waiting. Um, no, just 
a really quick answer to your question about you know the this um these meetups and i've i've watched the ones i haven't attended in person the um so i really have appreciated the the call to kind of look at many different from many different angles at you know this concept of word um and uh, to me i like the um the the idea of bringing it uh bringing to us the 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 view of how it's you know it's so much bigger than what you see literally written on the paper and um it's a it's a really good exercise to remind us that of the power of a word like you know it, it's when we look at all the the connotations that it may have had that it could have and that it will continue to have in the future it gives us a an idea of the kind of almost the weight that um, words can have, and um, maybe also gives us a pause in uh, just you know being overly lackadaisia with some words of our own. Wonderful. Uh, Joe has a quick suggestion. Uh, Joe, go ahead. Uh, so what about this book, Phil? Uh, I, didn't you recommend this? This is a metaphors, uh, we live by, by George Lakoff. Did you, I thought you recommended that. Who, me? I know. I thought it was, I thought it was Phil. Phil? I, I don't yeah. know. I, I, I forgot. I mean, he has to, yeah. yeah. We, All um, right. Well, that's, that would, that would be a, a good next book anyway. Yeah. Uh, Phil, yeah, you can look. choose whatever you want, Phil. Okay, all right. Well, I'm gonna- um, We'll give you lots of suggestions and you can choose anything that you okay, want. Okay, well, I wanna leave you since we're talking about words. Yes. Uh, and one of my favorite things is to look at, you know, read, you know reading these, uh, some of these texts, especially Aristotle, Plato, uh, is looking up the, the Greek words and the kind of their etymology. One of the things that Aristotle talks about in Poetics is maximizing the emotional effect. So we talked about the motivation, right? That word that's typically translated emotional effect in the original is psucha gogel, which literally means leading souls. Just like you have somebody leading you to hell, you know, like to Hades, a leader follows in front of you and takes you by the hand and leads you. Not necessarily to hell, but I thought that was an interesting picture, an interesting metaphor having an emotional effect is leading the soul of the listener somewhere where you're trying to take them. So there, there's your, there's a metaphor for tonight. <laughs> so I will leave you with that. Uh, thanks guys. Appreciate it. Always enjoy uh, meeting and discussing these. Wonderful. Thank